Welcome everyone to our um, virtual ward workshop and the focus is on tech enablement of a virtual wards. Um, I'm Breda Brown, I'm the Deputy Director of Digital Health at NHSX and I lead a programme which is the uh, regional scale programme supported by our National Innovation Collaborative. And that is about scaling remote monitoring uh, to enable us to support our patients at home. And today the focus is absolutely on virtual wards. So uh, I'll just go through uh, some basic housekeeping. Next slide, please. Do my Chris Whitty. Right, so the basic housekeeping, the session should last an hour. We are recording and we have started recording. Uh, all, as per all of our events, uh, the, um, the uh, slides, the recording of the slide and the slides will be available on NHS Futures. And we will pop the, for anyone who's not a member of the Innovation Collaborative NHS Future sites, there's lots of fabulous resources on there. So we will just pop a, uh, instructions on how to join that site into the chat now, one of my colleagues will. And hopefully uh, Emily has already shared some of her key documents, which will be on there. They're on there already. And our colleagues Merda will be doing so very soon. So I would direct you there. Um, we please do introduce yourself in the chat because as you will find as we go through, this is all about connecting people. The most valuable learning is the learning from each other. So um, yes, please do uh, connect. And we will, uh, if anyone wants, if any of us are tweeters, please do uh, feel free to tweet and tag NHS Innovation Collab because, and we'll pop that hashtag in the chat as well, just because that also helps share the learning. Next slide, please. Our aims and objectives from today are we are going to hear two real world examples of two tech enabled virtual wards and hear from Emily and Rachel and hopefully Marie on, on their story, because that is actually the most valuable learning and their aspirations and plans for the future, which I think are, are very relevant. We've had huge interest in this webinar and I think that's for two things. One, because long term condition management post pandemic, well, during and post pandemic is actually a key um, area of focus for a lot of people, but equally more and more people are seeing uh, tech enabled virtual wards as a way to manage larger cohorts of patients in a virtual way to create in inpatient capacity. So hence we wanted to really do this uh, webinar as soon as possible. We, in, in, wave, um, in wave one COVID, we uh, supported uh, with funding and implementation support, uh, a couple of virtual wards and uh, hub models in primary care to help with COVID. Um, and then by the end of March last year, particularly related to wave two, we had 90 services that were tech enabled for COVID oximetry at home or COVID virtual ward across the country. So I think that shows the appetite that people had and, and the need to do something different. And since then, if we keep going through to the next slide, since then um, we, um, have had a growth uh, in this area. But what does supporting people at home mean? And virtual wards is part of that. It means partnerships with patients and citizens. This is genuinely a sea change, I think, in how we manage long term conditions and how we it's not just empowering people, it's really working in partnership. But the key is enabling self care whilst so that the uh, citizen knows they're supported by their clinical team in the background. And there's a lovely quote from one of our patients in the Northwest during COVID, which said, they felt so supported, it felt like having someone in their own room. And as someone with a clinical background, for me, that was that actually is how we want things to feel for our patients. So uh, that sort of reassures me that you can be digital and still enable patients to feel this is really holistic, personalised care. Um, we're looking at digital tools to enable more care to be delivered at home or closer to home. But it is all about making an offer and not making assumptions on behalf of people. Digital home care is not right for everybody. And we've had lots of conversations with clinical colleagues. This is about the clinician deciding with the patient what is appropriate and then um, joining the path, the digital pathway. Uh, so for some people, face to face will continue to be what's required. Uh, but we know when we've got a capacity issue that if we can enable those patients who are really happy to have digital and would prefer digitally enabled home care, then actually we will be able to provide a better service to those who need face to face. We are working, and I believe some of my colleagues from NHS England uh, and Improvement are on today. Um, we are really aligning this with the NHS at home work. So there is a real focus on uh, how we can support virtual care, uh, non-tech enabled, and we are in a supporting the tech enabled component. 
And as I said, we have supported a regional scale program with implementation funding across the country, where some people on this call are already um, de delivering their virtual awards using that. Next slide, please. I talked about our journey so far, so I'm not going to go through that again. And as I say, we will share the slides. The only thing I would say is we do have a national innovation collaborative in partnership with the Rage and Network, where we've run lots of events through the year. We have our future site. So really, this is about collaboration across regions, within regions. So please do connect. And the last point is pinch with pride and acknowledge. What COVID showed us is we, we rem removed some of the not invented here concept that we've had for a long time um, in the NHS. And it's more about saying, actually, if somebody's doing that, let's learn from them and let's adapt and make it work for us. So I would say pinch with pride and acknowledge is a huge, huge um, focus for us all. Next slide, please. Uh, I've put two slides in which are from our NHS EI uh, work on um, NHS at home. We will share the slides. I'm not going to take you through these, but these are working definitions nearly finalised to what a virtual ward is. And they talk about digital being a component part. So there's a definition and on the next slide there are some principles, but I'm eager not to spend lots of time going through them on here because I want you to hear from Emily and Rachel and Marie, but they will come in the slides, um, which will be on futures very shortly after the event. So this slide and the next slide just talk about the principles and the definitions. So it's very small text, but I thought it was important you have those because uh, so we align all our work. Uh, next slide, please. So from our tech enabled work to date, there's three key uh, learning points um, in terms of challenges and opportunities when setting up. And I'm sure these will appear in Rachel and Emily's talks. One is the challenges around information governance, because people often get stuck on the DPIAs and uh, which is a, uh, and the information governance requirements. If you're looking to set up a virtual ward within your acute trust, actually, that's much easier because you're not sharing data. So that's quite easy. But we know that some of our um, uh, services have been uh, collaborations between acute and community or even primary care. And then you do need your data sharing agreements. So that is something you want to, to think about very early and become really friendly with your information governance leads. But this shouldn't be a blocker because information governance, despite the fact that most people feel it can be a barrier, is actually about enabling people to share the right information. So uh, again, uh, Chris, my colleague, has put some useful links against all of these and is on the call. So if there's any particular questions on any of these, do pop them in the chat. Clinical safety has also been a, a new thing for some people, which has felt rather onerous. But this is just ensuring that the products that you're looking to use, the technology project products, are actually fit for purpose from a clinical safety. And there's two documents mentioned in here, which I never heard of prior to starting all this work, um, as I'm sure many of you haven't, but now slip off the tongue very easily. And the first is the ZP DCB0129, which is the, the innovator uh, responsibility to ensure their product is fit for purpose. And, and, and many others, if you're looking at products, most of the products in the market, someone will have already done that. So actually it's about connecting with others and pinching with pride and acknowledging how they looked at those. Because you then as a, an organization have to complete a clinical safety process, which is this DCB 0160 form, which I know uh, Rachel, when we had a conversation, said something about this felt like such an onerous process, but then you realise you're already doing a clinical safety checklist because as a clinician, you wouldn't introduce technology without doing it. So it's about not getting stressed about something new because you're probably already doing it. It's just in a different format. And again, connecting with your CCIO, uh, CIO, CNIO and your clinical safety officer early on to uh, pick this up. And then last but not least, the procurement of uh, products, if that's what you want to do, if you don't have anything in existence, there are lots of useful frameworks in, uh, which can be which you can use. But again, it may be for some people you've got an existing EPR that you can use. We're not advocating particular products. What we're saying is technology can help you manage larger cohorts of patients because you get a dashboard view that allows you to prioritise. But my colleagues will say much more about that, I'm sure. Uh, and next slide, which I think is my last slide. Um, it, this is just a, a summary from our funding this year of where what people are looking at. So this is long term condition management and virtual wards. This is not addressing the potential opportunity in elective care, for example, but it's just what we've uh, funded implementation support, aiming to support over 135,000 patients, 10 conditions, all seven regions are involved in this, 
and there's 18 different digital solutions. So there's lots of technology on the market that can help with this. Um, and for long term conditions, the focus is predominantly asthma, COPD, heart failure, diabetes, frailty, and actually more, uh, more interestingly, patients with multiple comorbidities, because we know our patients don't come in nice specialty demarcation. So um, next slide. This is, I'm delighted to invite uh, Emily to speak. I didn't go through the agenda because we flipped over that slide. Emily is going to do a quick presentation. Then Rachel and Marie, if she's joined us, uh, are going to present from Airedale. And then we're, we're going to take questions. Do pop your questions in the chat though, because then they can see what the questions are like as we go through and it'll help us have a better conversation. So Emily, over to you. Thanks, Bree. Thanks so much for inviting us. We were keen to, to share what we've been doing. And um, as you said, always good to learn from um, others as well. Um, so at the Norfolk and Norwich, um, we've implemented a virtual ward. Um, it's actually for inpatients. Uh, just to give you a bit of context, um, we are uh, approximately 1100 bedded um, acute trust about three miles south of, of Norwich. Um, and if you just go to the next slide, please. Oh, sorry, it's me again. I was due to do it with Ed, um, with who's our CCIO, but he had a last minute engagement, but um, is happy to take any emails, although hopefully you'll have everything that you need as well on the Futures website. Next slide, thank you. So our journey so far, um, we were asked in uh, by NHS EI um, back in January to set up a virtual ward to support COVID in patients. We were obviously in um, our second wave and um, we were needing to support the trust in a different way. Fortunately for us, we'd actually already um, uh, purchased a number of current health kits which provided remote monitoring. At the time, we were looking to how we could support our staff on the ward to have to attend to patients less frequently. So by um, putting monitoring um, kits on the patients in the hospital um, would re reduce the time that they'd need to, uh, to attend. Um, and as things evolved, we were looking at different options. So when this came through, we were in a good place to start. And actually, by the end of February, we were already admitting our first patients onto the virtual ward. Um, we've set up, uh, so it's a clinical team that mirrors um, a normal ward. So we have band five nurses, we have a um, band seven um, ward manager, and we have a, an AA who's the operational nursing lead as well. Um, in the beginning, in the early days, we actually engaged shielding staff. Um, so we had a number of staff who were keen to help and support the trust, but weren't able to be physically on site. So we put a request out and were overwhelmed with um, the number of people that were so keen to help and created a really early enthusiastic team um, to support the virtual ward. Um, and then as obviously as time has moved on, some staff have stayed with us um, and we've got currently we're um, having a, a secondment of staff up to the end of September, but looking to make it more substantive. We created a governance process to fit with our um, current corporate process and we actually, uh, the virtual ward actually sits within digital health because we have patients across all specialties. Um, and obviously our initial focus was COVID, but we knew um, in the beginning that we were looking to support recovery as well and expand beyond this. So we set up the virtual ward thinking ahead um, and dropping the COVID name quite soon. So our primary goal essentially is to provide a safe, effective monitoring and follow up service for all patients in the virtual ward and to facilitate early discharge, admission avoidance and physical bed occupancy reduction where possible. Next slide, thank you. So why are we doing it? So the main reason obviously is for our patients. Patients on the whole, not all of them, but they do want to get home quicker um, and they want to be in their own bed. Um, and we know that patients recover quicker in their own environment as well. Um, with the system that we have, we are able to um, create bespoke monitoring, so alarms, so that it's um, specific to the patient's needs. Um, and the, what we found is that our patients are feeling much more secure about that transition. So we're able to get patients home earlier than they, they, they would have ordinarily because they know that they're in a safe environment. Um, obviously, as well, then there's less clinical um, hospital uh, risk with hospital acquired infections, um, which we know is, is, is common with extended length of stay. 
for our clinicians, those that are working on the ward, it's a new and flexible way of working and they really enjoyed being able to have the time to be able to talk to the patients um, and um, give a much more holistic view. Often our patients go on with one condition, but actually we're, we're, we're covering a lot of, of, of things for them. Um, obviously, we can increase the flow um, and this allows then for patients to be nursed in their correct specialty. And again, we know that this in, in turn can reduce length of stay. Um, and um, it's been rewarding to be able to support patients to get home. We've had some really nice stories where breastfeeding mothers, newly diagnosed cancer patients, where they've really felt the benefits of, of being on the service. Um, and then from an organisation um, point of view, we've been able to create that physical bed occupancy. So for our ward, these are inpatients. We've not created a safety net and we've been strict that, that actually these would be patients that would only normally be in an acute physical bed. So we're creating that, that capacity for them and in turn um, helping flow as well. Next, next slide, thank you. So um, the equipment we use is Current Health. Um, it's able to monitor all vital signs, so respiration, SATs. Um, it actually also monitors movement, um, pulse rate and body temperature. We also have uh, blood pressure and scales um, that we can um, add on if, if required. It's just an addition to the set. And there is spirometry, which we're looking to also utilise. Um, it all feeds through into a clinical dashboard that we can um, view from our laptop, our PC, or on an app on our phone. So for our team, they all have a iPhone that they communicate through with a, a different system called Alertive, but they can view their patients live. So I can I can literally be at home and, and check what's going on on the ward. Um, and all the patients are provided with a tablet, as you can see in the picture, um, that enables the video calls. So depending on what the patient prefers, we can call them by phone or we can video call them and you can see in the picture the device is what's on her arm so it's really quite small um, and um, comfortable for patients to wear. Next slide, thank you. So um, the service we provide is 24-7 monitoring. Um, we have a band five who's on day and night. We have daily uh, calls with our patients um, and more if, if required. We also have a pharmacy on seven days a week um, to support with medicines. And because they're inpatient, we use our EPMA uh, clinical system. We have a daily medical review where we have a consultant on seven days a week as well. Um, to be part of the ward round and an escalation. Um, we don't provide home um, IV therapy, but we link up with our existing services so that we can utilise and we've become quite clever in tapping into different services across the community, but they come under our virtual ward, um, enabling the patient to get home. Next slide, thank you. Uh, this is just a snapshot of our, our dashboard. So as you can see, we've had 202 patients now through our service. Uh, this equates to over 1,500 bed days saved. Those would have been days that patients would have been in um, an acute bed. Um, and also we've been capturing our patient experience since the beginning. And as you can see, it's more than 96% really positive feedback. And um, that's you know been really good to, to capture um, as well. We hover around between 15 and 20 patients on the ward at the moment. And we're working on a, a business case to, to, to look to increase those numbers. Next slide, thank you. So uh, this is a, just showing our pathways currently. Um, you'll see there's a, there's a framework on, on the side there. And basically, um, we sort of allow experience to drive design. So we thought that we would implement pathways, but what we find is that actually that the patient drives the pathways quite often. Um, so um, you'll see that we have quite generic pathways like awaiting treatment, awaiting diagnostics. Um, and we find that actually um, our team who, who are identifying the patients on the ward can create an onboarding uh, document to suit patients because if, if it's something that we can fit fit round. Um, but we do have um, patients from gastro. So our hot gallbladder is waiting for surgery. They often come in, say, on a Friday, but the surgery might not be on Monday. So they can go home, be monitored. We can still review their any pain. Um, and then they're scheduled for theatre as, as normal. 
Um, so we, we had a, a phase of, of long waits waiting for Papworth and um, we were able to monitor these patients on the virtual ward as well. Um, we've got a few patients with uh, pregnancy um, with confirmed COVID that we're monitoring at the minute, um, palliative care. Um, and um, we'll, our next pathway is what we're looking to work on is um, diabetes, IV self-administration and tissue viability. And they're in process and um, the clinicians are on board at the moment. Next slide, thank you. So um, just coming to the end now, just um, the challenges that we face. So um, there's the lines of accountability have been questioned, and this is more about understanding the functionality of the ward and, and that um, people feel like they, they still need to do stuff. And actually, because we've set it up in the way we have, they can literally hand over the patient into our care and we will only escalate if, if really is needed. There was a concern that the virtual care might create more um, uh, calls at the service desk, but actually there's been there's been no issues with that. The current health provide 24 seven technical support um, and that that hasn't been a problem for us, but it's something to watch out for for other teams, depending on, on what you might use. Um, and and the, the, the difficulty is the cultural change and getting, getting um, clinicians on board to make the referrals. At the moment, we're doing a lot of identifying the patients ourselves and pulling them through the service. And we'd love to encourage more referrals. Um, and, and lastly, just the number that we've currently got on the ward and looking to expand on that. I think just the last slide. Thank you. So we, we, we sort of set these phases out when we first launched and we're now looking, we've we've had some funding and are looking at expanding um, across Norfolk and Waveney now. Um, so it's uh, in its early, early stages, but we want to share what we're doing um, and uh, enable more patients to benefit from that, looking at additional pathways. Um, so, you know, really exciting uh, for the future of the virtual ward. And, and we are also just um, in our ABC stage of our business case for um, moving up to 40 beds and staffing that um, appropriately. So that's all in, in the pipeline. So thank you. Thank you thank so you much, so. Emily. Lots in there. And there's a few questions in the chat already. So if you want to have a look and prepare or if you feel you can answer them in the chat, please do so. But yes, they're inspiring as always. Um, so now we're going to go to north of the country, uh, to the northeast, and we've got um, Rachel Binks. And Rachel's title is interesting because Rachel's title is Nurse Consultant, Digital and Acute Care. I think that says a lot about Airedale's ambition and aspiration. And I'm not sure if Marie has joined, Rachel. I can't see her, but Marie was hoping to join, but she is unwell. So um, yeah. over to you, Rachel. Marie is here, but I have to say oh. she'll be embarrassed for me to tell you that she's in her bedroom. She's actually got COVID. She's not very well, but she's here listening and she certainly will answer some questions, I think. But she won't put a camera on. <laughs> that, that well, Marie, I'm very <laughs> impressed that you're here. So thank yes. you. That's commitment at its yeah. best. <laughs> okay, over to you, Rachel. Thank you. So there's my email address if anybody wants to contact me. And yes, my um, title is very interesting. It's since 2014, actually. Prior to that, I was nurse consultant for uh, critical and acute care um, because my back background is actually intensive care. And I, I came over from Leeds about 18, 20 years ago into that role. Next slide, please. So this is our hub. Um, this is a little bit older now, actually, this picture, um, because in the back, right at the back, uh, I don't know whether I can point, probably not, but right at the back there, we've actually now uh, is where our clinical call handlers sit, so our, our band three sit. You can see on the right-hand side and in the bigger picture at the bottom that um, all our uh, clinical assessors, our senior clinical assessors who are band sixes and sevens, sit with their backs to the wall so they can answer all the calls that come through. But the hub itself, the digital care hub, has been... Um, in our hospital since around about 2010 actually and if you just go on to the next slide please a little bit of a history of the services that we deliver from the hub so we went going right back to 2007 before the the actual hub was was um pulled together we actually were delivering prison health care so that's proactive um, outpatient consultations to people in prison and obviously the reason being to stop them having to travel out uh, for stop people having to go in stop them coming out to hospital and that sort of thing and often they didn't really want to either because they were quite embarrassed about coming out handcuffed to prison offices and obviously the cost of transferring out from uh, prisons to hospital was hugely uh, expensive so the business case it paid for itself really in the fact that we were not bringing these people out of prison and having to do that transfer. We then moved on in 2010-11 to care in people's own homes and at the time of course we didn't have tablets or um, 
laptops really we had laptops but they were quite big and cumbersome so we actually developed a system with a little digi box where you could actually talk to people through their television sets um, at home and um, the problem with that of course was um, it wasn't mobile people were often upstairs in bed when they didn't feel very well and had to come downstairs to turn the television on to link in with us and also it was one device one person so it was not commercially very viable and wasn't um, something that we could continue to invest in as a trust because in 2010-11 um, virtual um, teleconsultation, telemedicine wasn't really well known and wasn't really well supported. So our trust took a very big risk, actually, um, in, in pushing that forward. Um, so we, we moved from sort of people in uh, care in people's own homes to nursing and residential care in 2011-12 and went into a joint venture with a telemedicine, with a technical company called Involve VC. And I've been delivering that service for over 10 years, up to about eight, 900 co homes. Uh, we're now in about 600. Um, so we deliver to thousands of residents, actually, and, and care staff across the country, um, a telemedicine service. And you can see some pictures there at the bottom where one of our nurses is chatting to a resident in a care home. And of course, since COVID, this has become the norm. Uh, prior to that, people were, we were having exactly the same questions, Emily, as you've been having, having in terms of governance, in terms of safety, in terms of robust assessments, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, this is when technology comes in. If we can actually show with technology, we can make clinical assessments more robust, then I think we'll, we'll get more clinicians on board with that. So this is fascinating, all this work that we're doing at present. So in terms of what we moved on to then, we sort of, we, we looked at people at end of life 2012-13, got a really, um, a, some money from the Health Foundation, which helped us to pump prime our gold line service, which is for people at their end of life, in the last year of life on the gold standards framework. And that's supporting people in their own homes using telephone and video. And again, we've been doing that for about nine, 10 years now um, and have around about 1,000, 1,500 calls a, a month uh, from those residents. But our primary aim is to keep them at home and to die at home if that's what they want. Obviously, if we look at the gold standards framework and end of life care is what people want in their last few weeks, months and year of life that we're trying to make sure happens. And then, of course, COVID hit. So 2019, 20 or 2021, COVID oximetry at home, we were in a really good place to take that forward because we already had our, our digital care hub here, which is just like a virtual ward, literally is in an old ward. We've knocked the walls down. We've got a big uh, open plan that I showed you in the first slide. Um, and we can actually take um, any patient at all virtually. Uh, all our uh, uh, staff are here uh, and we sit in an acute trust, which is very, very helpful in terms of access to specialists and consultants, et cetera, as well, and allied health uh, professionals too. Uh, so we set up our virtual ward earlier in the year, have two or three hundred people through that working really well, quite busy now, I have to say busier now than perhaps we were in January, February. Um, and, and that's been working brilliantly. And we introduced the Lucy app at that time as well, which is an app that people can download onto their smartphones um, and they can they can then um, put their observations into the app and we can actually see them on our dashboard, just like Emily was describing with their model down there. Now, one of the things that we've been talking about, Marie and I, for many years, and we've had a vision and wrote a vision paper three or four years ago, was around virtual wards, NHS at home now, which is absolutely brilliant, uh, because at long last, we're actually seeing this come to fruition, which is fantastic. So we, we called our service MyCare24, and in 1920, we were sort of looking at how we could support more people at home, not just those at end of life, not just those in care homes. And we did some pilots around Parkinson's disease. We did some pilots around respiratory care and COPD. And that's what really gave us a really good foundation to apply for funding and to take forward the COPD at home, which is what we're going to talk about a little bit in this session. Um, and our service is called MyCare24, but COPD is what we're particularly concentrating on for 6,000 patients over the next year or so. Our hub, our whole um, raison d'etre really in the hub is to actually try and improve patient experience, change patient flow away from the acute trust and, and, and more into their own home. And obviously, um, by doing that, to reduce costs. Next slide, please. So I'm not going to go through all this in detail, but you can see exactly what our MyCare24, our COPD um, uh, service model is there. Remote monitoring via the app, which I've mentioned already. We're looking at um, moderate, severe and very severe, severe COPD across the whole of our place, Bradford District and Craven, which is our, our CCG now, and to support people at home. Our um, strategy in, in our area is to keep people happy and healthy at home. And as I said, we've been, been doing that for many years, and this is great that we can expand now and, and take this into COPD patients and so many of them over the next few months. We're really trying to reduce the dependence on, on the acute side of, of care in terms of hospitals um, and GPs, and, and we can show that we can do that with our previous services as well. 
In terms of financial commitment, you can see there that we've had funding, which has been absolutely fantastic from NHSX and our system, our local system partners have agreed to fund the next two years after this year to support us with our journey going forward. So we have three years of COPD um, funding, Micro24 at home. So in terms of referral routes, anybody can refer through to us, um, through from primary care, specialist respiratory nurses, pulmonary rehab programmes, ED, ambulance services and respiratory physicians. Next slide, please. We wanted to make that very broad so that anybody could be referred through. Now, this is very small. I can do uh, show you this. Um, we can have a copy of this uh, obviously made larger. I'm not quite sure why the black boxes are around some of the triangles. Um, but you can see this is our pathway, which is really quite simple. And the reason we've been able to do that is because we already had the digital care hub in place. And obviously all our staff were here in terms of funding. We could we could do it quite cheaply in a way because we actually already had 24 seven support from from call handlers, band threes and band fives. Um, band six and seven clinical assessors and obviously we've got people like myself and um, Marie in place and we've been here many years developing this service and this this virtual ward this virtual service um, going forward next slide please we run our hub very much like a, a call um, call centre so we try and coordinate care and you can see we've got things like these um, these cue boards uh, up in our in our hub so that we can see people that are waiting. These are specifically for the care homes. So we can see which of our staff are on duty and who's taking calls, how long the waits have been, how many calls we've handled, um, how many calls have been abandoned. And this is all used in terms of reporting back to our commissioners, particularly for the care home service, um, so that every month they can see how well or not we're doing. Um, and you can see just down the left hand side there, the services that we run, MyCare24, particularly around COPD now, um, but as I mentioned earlier around um, Parkinson's disease. And also um, we did, uh, we do accept people from the emergency department for 72 hours to provat proactively support them for three days um, post um, ED turnaround. Gold line is our end of life service. Um, next slide, please. In terms of the clinical case for change, it's the same everywhere, isn't it? You know, we've got a lot of demand on our services. These are our hospitals and our, our trusts. We've got um, a mental health trust, Bradford District Care Trust um, and two county councils as well. We're predominantly rural in the north, very urban in the south. Um, and our population is just over half a million. We were trying very hard to reduce um, the increase in ED attendance. And as you can see there, in terms of mortality for cancer, circulatory respiratory disease is quite high in our area and high deprivation as well as increased feralty. Next slide, please. In terms of operational case for change, we have a strategic partnership agreement and we actually put together, based on what they wanted us to do, our business case. And thank goodness, again, I'm not going to uh, stay on this for very long. It was agreed. And what we're trying to do now is support people. Um, we would like eventually for everybody with a long term condition to be supported at home. That's for the future. Next slide, please. Some of the challenges have already been mentioned by Breed in terms of IG record sharing, DPAs, DCB 0160s, etc. Uh, we are going to upload them onto the NHS platform so that you can see that. We also have a project with Taito Care going forward, which is the device where you can actually uh, monitor people's um, remotely uh, chest auscultation, looking in their mouth and nose um, as well. And that's something that we, we did our uh, DCB 0129s for. So we'll, we'll, they're uploaded, I think, already on the Futures platform. Really, really important project change management, having somebody in place that can support us with that. Um, and actually, the, some of the challenges that we have are around um, the development. You know, the ICSs in some places are not as developed as in others. In terms of funding, I mentioned that we got the three year funding and two years from our ICS, which has been absolutely fantastic. And we're really looking at true transformation across the whole system for other cases as well as the ones that we're looking at. Um, next slide, please. Again, I'm not going to take too long on this, but in terms of opportunities and benefits, they are huge. Um, you know, we're, we're looking at collaborative work and we want the whole system to work together as one. Uh, Marie and I have always said we need to have a single point of access. You need to have a single number. You need to have a for patients and for professionals to know exactly where to go and where to call. And one number obviously supports us to do that. We're trying desperately hard to reduce demand that is unnecessary on both primary and secondary care. If we can manage that remotely, then that's what we should be doing. And next slide, please. So just top three tips. This is my final slide just to say, you know, really engage with your local system. Uh, ours is called Act as One, our programme. We're trying to get not just across our place, our Bradford districts and Craven CCG, but beyond that to our in uh, integrated care system, which we've managed to do hugely down to the work that Marie's done uh, working with, with NHS, ex NHSE and our, our ICS. We feel that a project implementation lead is crucial. We, we are well staffed in the hub. We have um, a really good um, setup here. 
but we have so much going on we really need somebody to take control of all that and to project manage that i'm a nurse i'm not a project manager and i'm not very good at it um i just want things to happen like that so brilliant that we've got this person in post now um and also as emily mentioned earlier to have that dedicated 24 7 clinical team that aren't part of another team they actually are there to do the job they do because otherwise you're constantly pulled in all different directions and it's impossible to do 10 jobs at once and that's the end of my slides thank you very much Thank you, um, Rachel. So we can if we take the slides down now, I think it'd be good to just uh, bring you and Emily back on camera. Um, and we've got quite a few questions in the chat and Emily has been busy answering some, so thank you. Emily, we did, and Rachel, we did make a promise to you that we, we would try and protect you from everybody emailing you, because I realise there's 100 people on here and you've got busy day jobs. So I, don't, I know, Emily, lots of people are interested in your business case. So again, if that's something you're happy to pop on futures. So I think if we all try and put as much as we can on there and people go there, that would probably help. Yeah, no, that definitely because the I know the business case, the difficulty with the virtual ward is being able to articulate and identify the real cost benefits. Um, and that's been a, a something that we've worked through. So, you know, I'm happy to share what 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 the, what approach we're taking and if it does help somebody but yeah that would that would make sense I'll make sure that it's um okay to share and then we can add it onto there yeah and, and I think sorry, sorry Reed, I was going to say I think I'll check with Marie but we'll be happy to share ours as well and obviously I was um in many ways we have quite a lot of evidence because of all the other services that we run and that really helped us I think with our system to actually write a business case that people could could see was going to make a difference and could see where the savings were to be made and what I've heard from both of you, actually, and we'll go to the questions in a moment, is that actually if you have your clinical model set up, if you have your technology because you're already doing something, and it may not be that you started out planning to do this, and if you're doing it within one organisation, so if it's a service provided by an acute trust in the first instance, actually, you could do this really quickly because you don't have the IG issues, you don't have the procurement issues, and you have a clinical model. But obviously, by clinical model, Rachel, I mean clinicians to deliver the service. It's not an add-on. I think that's yeah, no, no. I was just thinking about our care home service because obviously that's across the country. And actually, in terms of that, we do need DPIAs and we do need to share. Yeah. And it's very difficult sometimes to get the, the all the records shared with numerous GPs and, and PCNs now and obviously CCGs and everything's changing. So it has been hard and is still quite hard sometimes um, to get the IG um, stuff in place. Um, but we, we keep pushing and I think people are, are much more aware of it now. But actually, if it's just a virtual, just, I can't believe I've said <laughs> that, because I know this is such a huge, if it's a virtual ward within an acute trust, it, it, the care home, I think, is absolutely slightly different and more, more, more difficult because of the uh, cross-sector sharing. Actually, it could be quite easy for people, because I think some people have asked in the chat, how long does it take to do this? And it's yeah, not the technology that takes the time, it's the clinical model. No. And actually, we would so we the ask came mid January, and we weren't at that point looking at a virtual ward concept. And and by the end of Feb, we were up and running. But main the actual main delay for us, we fortunately we'd done the DPIA, the clinical safety process uh, with the DCBO one two nine etc. was completed, so that did help things. Um, but for us, it was about releasing a staff member on on site to be able to do that that identifying of patients, and it was that because someone had to straddle a couple of roles that 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 delayed us and actually if we'd have been able to just pull them out um uh we could have started a bit sooner so there's there is the ability to to do it really quite quickly Wait, I think, actually, sorry Rachel I was just going to say but I think the other thing to say to add to what Emily's saying because obviously they're, they're sort of quite new in this virtual ward you know in getting the staff once you've got the staff in place and once you've got your 24 7 team to add other things to it is so much easier and quicker and, and cheaper because you've already got that minimal staffing level that you need and you just need to add a little bit to that so what we now find is when we do want to put through business cases or, or ask for further support it's actually it's not for 24 7 because we've already got that it's just the add-on for the extra bit we want to do and and actually adding to that we had a recent event where joe rafferty chief executive mercy care talked about there they've got a very well established telehealth service and he talked about you know people who are retiring at 55 who don't want to stop working but actually don't want to be doing maybe face to face but are really happy to do some virtual care that it can be a retention opportunity but as Emily you've said it also perhaps releases people from that day-to-day face-to-face pressure to doing something that perhaps feels different. 
Yeah, we've had um, we've had a couple of staff members in the beginning of the Ding Bank, one who was pregnant and not able to, to fulfil her current role. Um, another one who had a bad back, really wanted to work, but would have otherwise been signed off sick because we didn't have a role for her. And, and she was able then to work on the virtual ward. So it does create opportunities. And actually, one thing I didn't mention, um, you know, I said about the staff satisfaction, but also we've not had a single sick day since we started in mm. February. And I, I think that really does speak volumes as well. Yeah. Wow, I'm definitely going to, Marie's put her hand up, Rachel. So Marie, please come in. Uh, yeah, sorry about that. I was uh, just going to support really what Emily was saying in terms of being able to redeploy staff because over the years we've redeployed uh, 10, eight, 10 members of staff mm -hmm. and continue to do so. Um, and also uh, as you did, Emily, uh, during COVID um, and, and even now we've still got people that are clinically extremely vulnerable that sh um, wouldn't be working on the wards at the moment, but we've got them in the hub. Um, so they're actually helping support us to grow and, and innovate and develop, um, but we're also supporting them to remain in work. And that really helps not just in terms of people, uh, uh, in terms of the trust carrying on to deliver its services, but in people's mental health and well-being and feeling of actually being part of something and not being I'm shielding, I'm at home and I'm I'm out of the loop when all my colleagues are, are, are knee deep in this. They actually really, really appreciate the fact that they can come to work in a safe environment. And and just to add, sorry, just to, read, to add to that as well, I think, as you were saying, sort of redeploying people, we've had people come back who, who just thought their career was over. They didn't think they could do anything else now because they were unfit to work physically on the ward. And, you know, these people have got huge skills and huge experience of, of nursing. And, and we've had allied health professionals and paramedics here, too, which we can't not use you know and, and it's fabulous and it gives them great worth and like marie said in terms of supporting mental health it's been i think hugely beneficial for some people fabulous uh, it's interesting there's chats there's connections being made in the chat from people who obviously haven't seen each other for a while you've got uh somebody just connected with you rachel but please do connect with people as well as rachel and emily with others um a couple of questions on the sharing with other systems and i know emily you've been I, I talked about you don't have an epr which i think just yes. shows how Yes, absolutely. But which shows how this is innovative. People are making things work, uh, despite perhaps not being considered the most digitally mature organisation. So uh, we shouldn't judge anybody. Uh, but there's quite a few questions about um, connections with System 1, for example, transfer of information to GPs. I don't know if either of you want to comment on that. We use System 1 in our trust breed, so we're very lucky because we have access directly with that. Um, and obviously we're an integrated trust, so we've got community services working with us too. So so that's been hugely beneficial for us. And even if the trust ever does move over to something different, because I don't think System 1's very good. It's very clunky, actually, for acute services. Um, that We won't change. We will stick with that because it's made a huge difference to us in terms of enabling us to do um, a, a huge amounts of information, you know, linking in across, across primary and secondary care and the social mm -hmm. care as well, actually, in mental health. Emily, is there anything you want to add to that? No, just that it's it's on our radar. I think I've put in the chat around. Um, we have created um, a system to make sure that the GPs are updated via our discharge letter, so they get a transfer letter when they're transferred on to explain why and and update them as to where they are, and then they get the official discharge letter. But as for visibility, it's not something that we have done yet, but it is absolutely on our our radar. <laughs> Great, and Marie. Yeah, just to add, um, as Rachel described, we do use System 1, so any GPs that are on System 1, we're obviously able to see the full health record and across Bradford Districts and Craven, primary care, even social care are on System 1. So we really have got a single EPR across our own local system, but more widely, so for areas where they've got different systems in use through our um, care homework, we work with EMIS GPs, Microtest, Vision, and we have been able to, we have now got um, read-only access to EMIS. So we can see that through the third party in the clinical tree. Um, and at the end of all our consultations, when we, we send over what we call the quick glance summary. So it's a summary of the of the assessment and it goes over via a task and it and it lands in the EMIS workflow or the vision or the microtest. So we're keeping GPs informed regardless of what um, system they're on. So it, it, you can enable that. 
and it's not too difficult. It's your data sharing agreements that need yeah. to be in place to do it, but it's it's um, it's quite doable. Yeah, and actually, you know, people sort of sometimes go, oh, no, data sharing agreement. Uh, but actually, your IG colleagues will be, they, well, you'll have done those for other things in the trust. So it's sort of not thinking you have to start everything from scratch, although it's different. It's still there are people will have done some of this. So I think um, it's not as bad as it sounds. And um, something we often get uh, people talking about is, are we driving inequity and exclusion by not everybody having access? And one of the questions early on was um, from Rafi was about age demographics. And have you, you know, have you come across where you feel anyone is? Because we're all we all all want inclusive digital transformation. Um, but yeah, what are your views? So we originally started off with a, a sort of longer exclusion list, actually, um, you know, thinking that it may not suit patients with dementia or those that, you know, aren't tech savvy and, and all the rest of it. But actually what we found is that we've had patients with learning difficulties, um, dementia, um, those that are totally tech phobic um, and they've got on really well. So we I kind of mentioned about our patient driving the pathways and, and actually that's what we found. So. Mm -hmm we don't say no to very many people at all um and we haven't had to and because the kit is you know it is just that 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 device that you saw in in the picture and and everything else is kind of set up in in the background quite easily and if if the patient has um relative carer support that can assist we we kind of work around it and so it hasn't actually been a big issue um for us although we thought it would be in the beginning mm -hmm. We we found actually that more older people wanted to use the app than than people in the middle age or our age, which surprised me. Um, people over seventy for the COVID oximetry at home specifically, they were very keen to use use the app, um, whereas younger people weren't. So. Yeah, yeah they want to get home. So what we're yeah. finding is that they're actually hearing conversations happening with another patient and then going like, can, can I have it? <laughs> can I have some of that, please? Yeah. So we're actually doing some comms at the moment around, you know, have you have you asked your nurse about virtual ward type situations? So trying to just drive it from the patient. Yeah, absolutely. And Marie? Yeah, just to um, add to that, one of the things that we have just um, done is, Rachel touched on it earlier, we've just recruited an implementation manager specifically for this project. We've, it's a six month post, but the way that we see it is that as this work develops and we move from on from COPD onto the next and the next that this post will evolve with it. And um, one of the things that uh, the this post is about is um, digital inclusion. It's around um, accessing hard to reach groups and it's been more of an outward facing person. So um, they are they'll bring back their learning and help us to then tweak and evolve and change the, the service as we go. Um, the person that we've um, appointed has had many years as a practice manager um, so that we're going to use them as well it's going to be a big part of that role is engaging GPs and primary care in the service um, but they've also worked on some uh, projects um, around um, um, equity of health and uh, ha you know working with hard to reach groups so now, so we're really looking forward. She's called Lisa to Lisa starting with us uh, in early September because we think we'll really be able to drive up as well the the digital inclusion piece, the hard to reach groups, and also really, really engaging with um, primary care and doing that external piece to really embed this service within our system. Yeah, I mean, Absolutely. I don't know if any, anyone wants to say any more on that. Uh, it's such an important issue. Um, the There's another question. So uh, I think it's Bushra has made a point about it's interesting that this isn't that the patient's driving the pathway, that you've got a sort of generic model, Emily. And I think similarly, Rachel, you've talked about condition specific, but I think you're you're very generalist in what you could do. Because actually, there's a lot of talk about COPD pathways, diabetes pathways. And actually, what we're hearing from both of you is that actually you can have a generic model yeah. in a way. It's like you've got a recipe and the ingredients might change, but you can Absolutely. do that quite easily. So, yeah, we, we actually looked and we were quite 
um, sad, I suppose, weren't we, Marie, to not be commissioned last year for a frailty service. We wanted it to be all a frailty and we put a business case together across our system, but we weren't ready for it then, I think. And it's great, as I say, that we've got the funding now for the COPD. But, you know, we wanted to look at frailty across the whole system because actually people that are frail can have anything wrong with them. And these are the people that we're wanting to keep safely at home and away from hospital if possible, um, because often they're, they're better at home. You know, they walk around the furniture, which is great. They'll fall when they come into hospital. Um, and it doesn't matter whether they've got COPD or Parkinson's or, you know, it doesn't matter what they've got. Um, we've got the specialists in the trust to support us dealing with that and writing the pathways, as Emily said earlier. So, yeah, absolutely. That That is our vision to anybody who is at home to have support virtually so they can literally be in, in a virtual bed, a virtual ward, you know, no matter what yeah. their issue. Emily, I'll bring you in and maybe if you could focus as well on, you know, what does that mean from, let's say, an accountable consultant, you know, in a specialty? Because I think we often, you touched on this in your presentation, that accountability, because if it's quite generic, how do you deal with that? But Yeah, so um, just on the, the sort of pathway and, and the patient driving it, we've set up a, a template, basically an onboarding template. And so we, we can just um fit um the, the patients in it so that's so that's how how we do we do that um we've also looking at almost that that initial conversation that right to reside do they need to be here and 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 getting virtual ward in at the beginning of kind of do they need to be in an acute physical bed to to you know and so to, to get those referrals early and then from the consultant perspective um essentially on the ward because they're still an inpatient it will show that they are under that consultant but we have those consultants on the virtual ward that have that um responsibility day to day and and actually we it's been quite good because um a patient may have been in for COVID, but the cardiology consultant who's overseeing the ward that day also can tweak their blood pressure med medication or whatever else. And we'd only really need to escalate if if they were coming back in. And actually, even if we didn't escalate because of the onboarding template that we have, it's quite prescriptive on on the situations that you need to bring them back in. Also, we're all you know nurses and and um, you know experience. Um, and so. We don't need to have that conversation to bring them back in because they're an impatient anyway. So it's just having that kind of um, the documentation behind it to, to it's like the governance to 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 know what the process are so the staff are aware. Um, and, and, and that for for the ones that are utilising the service well, they they are really happy with it. It's just bringing those others on. We had an interesting email recently from, um, oh, I won't say who from, um, from a specialty, <laughs> and um, they were saying really pleased with the patients that we've put through the service, just really concerned this may become the norm. And it's kind of like, well, yeah, but, you know, how exciting would that be that we could nurse our patients at home? At so, home. you know, it's just yeah. winning those people around and, and getting them to have confidence. And I think now our numbers, uh, our patient feedback, our staff feedback is helping to, to drive that. Great. And Ray, anything you'd like to add to that, Rachel? Because I think that accountability question yeah. is one of the bubbles. I mean, ours is a nurse led service um, and, you know, we, we have to say, and I'm talking 10 years ago, struggled in a way to get not to get interest. We had doctors that were interested, but they weren't interested in being here 24 <laughs> seven. Um, so and be, but because we're based within the hospital, you know, we, we can access the whole hospital just like any other department here. So if we do have a worry with somebody with COPD or diabetes, then we get on to whoever's on call. So we get on to the medical registrar or to somebody and have a conversation with them. We, ha we have set up. Um, with our care home service, a portal in the emergency department, we're not using it much at the minute, but the portal allows them to access the care homes directly. So any care home with telemedicine in place, um, the ED consultants can, can dial directly through to the care home themselves. So if we have somebody that we really don't want to bring in, um, but we just think we, we need that oversight of a, a consultant in ED first, then they can actually make that call for us too. And, and we also do things like remote discharge assessment. So, you know, we, we have people in in their in beds who um, need to go back to a care home or a nursing home and we can get the ward doctors and the ward nurses and the case managers and the discharge team and the social you know everybody involved in that conversation before they come out but we all we do it remotely so that we can just get that person out on the day they're medically fit for discharge which hopefully reduces um, deconditioning and all the other issues that Emily mentioned when we talked about risks of being in hospital. So thank you both. We're going to run out of time. There's two very quick so we can have very quick answers. There's one about uh, from um, brush her about um, the uh, the hot gallbladder.
pre-op? What's the value of that? So, you know, the point about let's not just monitor because we can monitor what's yeah. the clinical need. So if you could deal with that, Emily. And then there's just a question which maybe one of you could respond to in the chat about outpatients. Do you just revert back to normal outpatient processes post-discharge? Uh, yeah, so the hot gallbladders, they would normally stay as an inpatient. We schedule ours, I think, like a Monday, Wednesday, Friday for surgery. So if you come out of those days, you stay in a bed until you um, are operated upon. So it was about releasing that acute bed for somebody that actually needs it. Um, it's not necessarily that we're always observing them, but they're on our dashboard and we are yeah. checking in with them. And it may be about pain, it can be about medication review, um, or it can be about their observations. Uh, so that's the hot gallbladder. And then the outpatients, the good thing about the service, is because as um, Rachel was saying we have access to to all our hospital systems we can help with outpatient appointment making those making new ones um, and and changing things for them organizing transport all of those extra swabs all the things that they normally have in, yeah. in the trust you can coordinate the care Emily can't you and I think it's, it's more it's not just about in hospital and outpatients it's everything else to do, linking in with the GPs linking in with them um, falls teams linking you know linking in with tissue viability services anything in the community we can coordinate all that care because we do it in our end of life service and there is a little video on online if anybody wants to look at gold line airedale you'll see how the service works and how we try and coordinate care with just that one single point of access i'm we got to 12:59, so i feel i have to bring it to a close but i could stay here listening to you for ages and i'm sure many there's lots of questions still we will try to pick up any questions in the chat and liaise with emily and rachel and perhaps we've got the answers onto um, the future site, into the discussion forum. But yes, um, I mean, I would give a huge uh, clap of a uh, thank you to um, Marie in the background as well. Um, it's been a really inspiring uh, conversation. And I think what you've shown is it's possible for anybody to do this. But I think Jyoti's come up with, it's the passion that both of you show for really improving patient care that comes through. So uh, well done on that. There's a couple of things on the slide at the moment. Uh, if you want to join the Innovation Collaborative, there is an Innovation Collaborative Manager email address to join it. Uh, please feel free to follow on Twitter. Uh, there's a hashtag there for the Innovation Collab Collaborative. And then there's a general email address should anybody near to, need to contact us. Thank you. We will continue to try and have these events to share learning. So watch our uh, Twitter hashtag. Thank you. OK, bye, Thank everyone. You. Thanks, ladies. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.